see, folks, when you really start to analyze the data, the Big Bang Theory is miserable science. Let me give you a couple of examples. We could, we could spend literally hours looking at it, but just a couple for you to think about. For instance, Jupiter. Jupiter is far, far too hot for there have been a Big Bang 18 to 20 billion years ago. Welcome, viewers. As it goes for introductions, and I'm sure you will agree, the pile before us bears witness to an especially direct orifice. Brad Harrop, a self-proclaimed scientist, although unclear in what field, composes himself to refute mountains of hard data with his anachronistic interpretation of the Bible. So let me apply my German accent to this particular endeavor and demonstrate that the incoherent mumbling bears the mark of its lowly origin. Folks, the only problem is, right off the bat, it violates two very fundamental laws of science. You've created matter, and you've gone from a chaotic explosion to an ordered universe. You know, my seven-year-old is smart enough to realize there's a problem with that. We were driving around in the car one day. My middle son, he said, Dad, that's kind of dumb, isn't it? I thought, hey, he's getting it. He said, it's kind of dumb to think that you can get an ordered universe from an explosion. I said, you're absolutely right. I said, can you imagine what would happen if we took a stick of dynamite and we put that in your bedroom and we blew it up? <laughs> he laughed. He said, it probably wouldn't look any different, would it, Dad? Folks, at age seven, he doesn't know about the laws of thermodynamics but he is smart enough to realize there's a problem with that. Well, Brett, the comedic cliché about the inherent disorder of a seven-year-old's bedroom was nowhere near as hilarious as your presumably serious proclamation concerning the nature of the Big Bang. Your smug insistence that the latter is at odds with scientific laws you obviously know fuck all about already screams hypocrisy, but then you even get the timescale wrong. It wasn't a slip of the tongue either, since the 18 to 20 billion year figure came up twice. I mean, in the age of Google, it takes about two seconds to find that the universe is 13.772 plus or minus 0 0.059 billion years old. I guess this goes a long way to demonstrate how much effort you put into researching the subject you deem yourself fit to preach about. I will be terse on the Big Bang and only add a tiny annotation to your laughably simplistic attempt to construct a straw man. The Big Bang does not refer to an explosion within space, but the emergence of matter, space and time from an original singularity. This initial state presents a breakdown of current understanding, which leads many to insert their particular deity as a substitute for the actual answer. The honest thing to say, however, is I don't know. The Big Bang was first postulated in the late 1920s by priest and astrophysicist Georges Lemaitre, who solved Einstein's field equations and found that the universe was expanding. About the same time, Edwin Hubble conducted distance measurements of other galaxies and found that light of more distant galaxies was more redshifted than that of closer ones. Redshifts are attributed to the Doppler effect familiar in the changing pitch of sound waves emitted by a passing vehicle. Similar to the engine noise of the race car, the light of receding galaxies is shifted towards a lower frequency, which for the visible spectrum means towards the red. You can see this from the two calcium absorption lines marked by the arrow. For the distant Hydra, they are shifted further to the red than for the closer Virgo. This leads to a deduction even you, Brett, should be able to comprehend. If things are further apart today than they were yesterday, they were even closer together, a fortnight ago. And a year ago they were... well, I think you get the general picture. Furthermore, the detection of the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1964 and subsequent precise measurements of the intensity spectrum lend conclusive credence to the Big Bang model. The redshifted remnants of this primordial light 
stem from approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang. At this time, temperatures in the early universe had decreased to about 3000 Kelvin, which allowed electrons and protons to form electrically neutral hydrogen. The resulting absence of free electrons meant that radiation was no longer scattered by these electrons and the universe became transparent. Today, science and technology allow us to look into the past and reveal our actual place in the cosmos. Keeping this picture in mind, let's hear Brett's version again. I want us to take a minute and, and look at the science side of the Big Bang. Because in all reality, it's miserable science. What our children see is a, a picture of this cosmologic explosion and they're told that, that when in roughly 3.4 seconds, everything radiated out into space and that space ex itself expanded. Sounds great. Sounds just like a nice little storybook. So Brett, you proclaim with the smug complacency of a French aristocrat that the standard model of cosmology is miserable science and that it sounds like a nice little storybook for someone who fancies the story of two naked people in a garden with a talking snake who then procreated apparently by way of incest this reeks of blatant projection. As we will soon find out, however, your introductory slur on the Big Bang Theory is rather dim compared to the sheer nescience emanating from your next excretion. You see folks, when you really start to analyze the data, the Big Bang Theory is miserable science. Let me give you a couple of examples. We could, we could spend literally hours looking at it, but just a couple for you to think about. For instance, Jupiter. Jupiter is far, far too hot for there have been a Big Bang 18 to 20 billion years ago. The reason I say that is it is still giving off twice as much heat as it's receiving from our sun, telling us it's still in the cooling off phase. I am certain. For someone as mentally lazy and deluded as you, a line like this sounds deeply impressive. However, this apparent profundity is solely rooted in your failure to even rudimentarily grasp the monumental scales of the solar system. So let me throw some numbers at you. Jupiter receives a total of 5.014 times 10 to the power of 17 watts from the Sun and radiates 8.365 times 10 to the power of 17 watts back into space. So, where do the missing 3.351 times 10 to the power of 17 watts come from? After all, this quantity surpasses humanity's energy output by about five orders of magnitude. As it turns out, the answer doesn't require any transcendent spectres, but gravitational potential energy. Jovian planets form by accretion of hydrogen helium gas around an icy core. Like a comet falling to Earth, the gas falling onto the planetary embryo releases energy. To estimate the amount, let us imagine an infinitesimal mass dm falling from infinity towards a mass m. We know that the energy dE is the negative line integral of the force f times dr from infinity to the final position of dm. With the force determined by Newton's law of gravity, we can solve the integral and get the expression for the energy dE that results from an infinitesimal mass falling onto our baby planet. Since we have only considered a single infinitesimal mass and Jupiter is rather big, we need to add up all the tiny bits. That involves, you guessed it, another integral. To spare you the agony, I will jump right to the solution. The gravitational potential energy for a planet is three times the gravitational constant times the mass squared and divided by five times the radius. Plug in NASA's fact sheet for Jupiter and we get a staggering 2.065 times 10 to the power of 36 joules. Dividing that by the 3.351 times 10 to the power of 17 watts you fancy so much allows us to determine the time it would have taken Jupiter to cool, assuming a constant loss rate. Well, Brad, I suggest you sit down first and grab something to bite on, because this is going to sting a little. It is about 195 billion years, which I am sure even you will notice is significantly more than accounted for in your fairy tale. 
Of course, in the past, higher surface temperatures would have resulted in higher radiation intensity and some of the initial energy would have had already dissipated during the formation process, but there is no inconsistency with the Big Bang model. Considering that for this rough estimate I ignored other energy sources, like nuclear fusion and exolution of hydrogen and helium, suggests that your analysis is not entirely accurate. Folks, if the Big Bang happened 18 to 20 billion years ago, it should have long cooled off by now. And yet we have photographic evidence from NASA of volcanic eruptions on the moons around Jupiter. We know, for instance, that Ganymede, one of the moons that's encircling that planet, it has a, a strong magnetic field. Now, folks, anytime you have a, a magnetic field, that lets us know it's generated by liquid molten metal inside. I have to ask you. Did you look up Jupiter's moons yourself? And if indeed, why did you withhold the explanation put forward by the originators of said photographs? The answer, I suspect, involves the slightly inconvenient nature of NASA's consideration regarding Jupiter's moons. Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto have slightly elliptical orbits. Hence the gravitational force of the moon's experience is strongest at the periapsis and weakest at the apoapsis. Similar to water tides on Earth, the rock of Jupiter's moons is constantly deformed due to varying gravitational field strength. The resulting friction heats up the interior. This may seem like voodoo to you, but I assure you, it stems solely from your ignorance regarding planetary motion, a point you conclusively demonstrate in your next confusion. We also know the Big Bang violates another scientific law known as the, the conservation of angular momentum. No, Brad, it doesn't. And your fantasy of what this conservation of angular momentum might be, unsurprisingly, lacks mathematical rigor. Instead of suffering through yet more of your tedious splutter, let me continue with a proper definition of the angular momentum. Should my limitation of your speaking time provoke accusations of unfair argumentation, I invite everyone to watch the original. You will find that my call for brevity is totally warranted. The angular momentum L of a single object is defined by the distance r between it and the center of rotation and the object's velocity and mass. In mathematical notation, L is the cross product of r and v times m. The angular momentum is a vector that points up for anti-clockwise rotation and down for a clockwise one. For a system composed of several particles, the total angular momentum is obtained by adding the individual momenta. The angular momentum is conserved if no external torque acts on the object. Hence, for an isolated system like our universe, the total angular momentum is constant. The individual momenta, however, may change. Simply put, if you have a central axis that everything is coming out of, then it should be rotating in the same direction. Maybe you can picture in your mind a, a spiral galaxy. So folks, if there really was just a, a single Big Bang explosion, we would expect the heavenly bodies to all be moving in the same direction. Now, would there be an, a, an occasional exception to that? Maybe something that had bumped into a, another cosmic body? Absolutely. But folks, bear in mind, within our own solar system, we've got Venus, Uranus, and possibly Pluto that are rotating backwards from the other planets. Six out of the 63 moons here in our own solar system, they're going backwards. So Uranus rotates backwards. Now, this fine piece of Lagrangian distortion almost escaped my notice, but unfortunately for you, it didn't. Which now affords me the opportunity to compare the orbital and the rotational angular momenta of Uranus. Rather inconveniently for your pontification, the rotation amounts to only 0.00013% of the total angular momentum, which I would refer to as occasional. But apart from that, three questions rise to the surface. First, is the source of your inanities God's highest representative in the Federal Correction Institution Berlin? Have you paid your taxes? And what sort of angular momentum would a singularity have? Well, regarding the third question, I am not sure whether it even makes sense to define an angular momentum. 
In the beginning the radius was zero or unmeasurable, mass did not exist yet and there was no fixed reference for things to revolve around. Defining the initial momentum as zero would intuitively make sense since the universe is isotropic and the angular momentum vectors of galaxies and clusters point in evenly spread directions. But there is something more to be seen in this picture. During an interval of 2 million seconds the Hubble telescope collected every fleeting photon coming from a tiny patch of space in the constellation Fornox. The light from some of these galaxies has traveled 13 billion years. It is the furthest humanity has ever peered into space and it is the furthest we have ever looked back in time. This picture represents the achievement of questioning, of doubt and the realization that everything is possibly wrong. In the face of mystery, the honest researcher will admit ignorance and strive to expand their horizon, while conceited simpletons like Hubert attribute everything to the whims of a shaman in the sky and stagnate in the misconception that it is absolute truth. I do not argue against religion in general, but a fundamentalist episteme contradicted by reality. If a god really exists, honest research will only make him shine brighter. And if not, we can still marvel at the fact that we are comprised of the very particles formed 13.7 billion years ago, forged in the furnace of a dying star. We are stardust become conscious.